All right. Tonight we'll talk about traits, and my talk will be about traits, traits from the ground up. So basics on traits and what the difference between traits and interfaces is, for example, and how you can use traits to write very abstract and generic code in Rust. My name is Pascal, and these days I do web development related stuff, but also Rust. I'm one of the co-organizers here at Rust Cologne, and my handle on various places on the internet is KillerCup. And if you want to read some ramblings about some stuff that also often includes Rust, go to deterministic.space. First off, a warning. I threw these slides together and all I could come up with is code. So, lots of code. But also, please, please, please interrupt me when you have questions. Uh, as Florian just mentioned, uh, there's a microphone, just raise your hand and he'll bring it to you and we have your questions on video. Please use the mic. So why are we even talking about traits? Let's first take a step back and talk about what we're even doing when we are programming. And most of the time, the things we are doing is dealing with data and doing some stuff with it. So let's do some stuff with this. So this is an example, I hope you can all read it, uh, is a function called make true. It takes as input parameter a string slice and gives you back a string. And how do you make stuff true? You shout them, obviously, by adding exclamation marks at the end. Okay, so this is good. We can now make string slices true. And this is a very useful function because we have string slices in many various uh, forms. But also, we maybe want to represent our data in a more domain-specific way. For example, if we are actually dealing with uh, facts, we may not want to take a string slice, but a reference to a fact. This fact is indeed just a structure, which has one field called text, and it is a string. The function body is exactly the same. The only difference is that we are now returning a fact instead of just returning the string. Nice. With that out of the way, let's actually add some behavior to the data itself and not just as a free standing function outside of it. How did you add data, uh, behavior to data? Well, in most programming language, there is a concept that's called a method. And you may be asking, how do you write a method in Rust? The answer is rather simple. You write impl and the name of your data type, open curly brackets, and then you write some function. Maybe copy paste in the function you just saw on the slide before this one, and close parentheses. Now our example looks like this, and voila, we have a method. We now can use this method to give an effect, call make true on it, and get back a true fact. Let me go back one slide though. What is self, you may be asking? And indeed, self is something we did not have before. Before we had some input parameter of the type, and this is the most obvious difference between methods and functions. Methods operate on the data you actually are decorating. You can access this data using a form of self as first parameter. Self is very explicitly set in Rust and not implicitly given by a keyword like this, as in JavaScript or Java, for example. And you may be wondering, um, form of self? Yes, form of self, because in Rust, you actually have to annotate which kind of self you want. Do you want a reference to a self that you can only read? Do you want to have a mutable reference to self? Or do you maybe want to get self or mut self as a mutable self and take ownership of self? The owned version is the only version that can actually 
takes the data and destroys it. The other ones can only read or manipulate it. Okay, let's look at another implementation of make true. So here we take a mutable reference to our fact and we don't generate a new string to put in a new fact, we actually just change our fact. So it's now an alternative fact or something. And another implementation would be to take this fact as a mod self without taking a reference and returning it in a changed form. With the difference that you can no longer use original fact you put into this. Okay, now we've covered data and how we can add behavior to it. But I mentioned that this talk was actually about traits and you may be asking, is this a trait? And yes, it is. But it doesn't have a name. And we can give it a name. We can call this trait truth and write the function signature or the method signature in this case. It is, in this case, reference to self, as we saw in the first example, and return something, some self. Okay, we'll come back to this. Let's implement it first. Same thing we did above, except for the first line where we say impl truths for fact and not just impl fact. And indeed, you can implement this trait for basically everything if you wanted to. For example, for integers, we could make integers true if that makes sense to you. Why are we even doing this? What, what's the advantage of writing traits instead of just adding methods to data types? Well, the most obvious one is that we now can name these concepts and we can share the behavior between different data types. And also, we can abstract over this behavior. And the way we do this is by writing an implementation like this. This is a function called print news. And as an input parameter, it takes a reference to a slice of t, like some list that contains t's. But what is t? t is just a placeholder, a type parameter, and it has some constraints on it. As we can see, right after the function name, in the angular brackets, t colon trues means we have some placeholder called t, and we need any type of data that implements the trait trues we've just written. So, in this function we can do some stuff with this facts list, and we can at least make them true. Because we know any type in this list implements truth. But actually, if you look at it, this does not compile. Because we're not only making facts true, we're also printing them. And indeed, Rust C, the Rust compiler tells us, T does not implement standard format display, because we have no idea how to actually display facts. This error message is actually quite explicit about it. T cannot be formatted with a default formatter. It has some helpful ideas, like, for example, that the trait display is not implemented, and that we can do other stuff with it, but also that it is required by format, and format is actually something the print macro calls internally. That's all good, but why? Okay, what do we actually know about this T? We know that it implements truth, and well, actually, that's it. That's basically it. I'm sorry. Uh, there are some asterisks there. Ask me later if you want to have a discussion about automatically implemented traits, but basically all we know is that T implements truth. If you also wanted to print it, we need to add another implementation, and indeed, uh, we can just say so. Like we can import standard format, 
a module that contains a display trait, uh, trait and say, okay, our team needs to implement truth and also display. This works. Assuming that given our example code before, we also add this implementation of another trait that's come from the standard library, display, and tell the compiler what to actually do when we print these facts. You don't actually need to read this, it's just we can implement traits that someone else has written in their crate. For example, the standard library, and implement them for our data types as well, not just the other way around. And indeed, here we go. It's the main function calling print news on the list of facts. And yes, we've just printed the news. Interesting fact, if we go back to this, the t colon trues plus format display is uh, maybe not the most interesting information you have in this particular place right after the function signature. So there's another way of writing it. And this is a where syntax. You can write t colon trues and display right after the function name. Also, you can write just the T after the function name, and then after the function signature, put a where and say trues plus display. Just so you don't get confused, this is a absolutely equivalent syntax. By the way, talking of syntax, we can also add placeholders in other places. For example, in our implementation block, we can say, okay, we want to implement this trait for this type, but with the placeholder in the type as well. Like this implementation block is valid for all vectors where the items implement the debug trait. And debug is basically the machine readable version or the human debuggable version of the display trait. Okay, this is basically all you need to know if you want to write methods and traits and implement them for your types. But you can also implement other stuff. You can add other things to your traits. And for this, we just need to take one more step back and talk about what even is a trait. A trait is a collection of associated items. The most basic one, associated functions, is what we've seen all along. It's methods. But there are also associated types. So consider this example. There is an iterator trait, and all you need to do to implement an iterator is to provide a next function. There are way more functions on iterators than I'm showing here, but next is the most important one. And an iterator works like this. You have something that wraps your data, and if you call the iterator's next function on it, you get a new value. Like from your data, from your list, for example, where you have a vector of integers and you get the next one, for example, to implement a for loop. And now you need to say, what does next return? We implement our trait on a vector, and vector is kind of generic over the content, so you might say, okay, whatever is in my vector, this is the type of item I get from my next function. But if you write an implementation for another data type that may not be generic, you can't just look at the signature of the data type and say, hmm, okay. Obviously, this has to be also a T, because there is no T. So with associated types, you can specify what you want to call this type that you want to return, because this type is not a generic type over your data. It's a generic type that's, that becomes concrete in your implementation block. So for example, if I have a data type called for integers, that gives me, you guessed it, for integers, uh, my return type is an integer. If I had a data type that contains a file and I want to read lines from it, my return type in this iterator would be string, for example. 
So associated types is a way to give a name and also in the iterated defin uh, uh, sorry, I'm in the trait definition to give the constraints these types need to fulfill. For example, I could say I have a debuggable uh, iterator and my item type needs to implement debug. This is associated items. Uh, there's one more item we can cover. It's kind of a niche case, but I'm just showing it. Associate constants. For example, if you have a super log trait and you want to prefix each log message with a specific tr string that is specific to your type, but you don't want to have a message that always returns the type name, you can write a constant. So this is just a constant that lives alongside your trait implementation. A good example from the standard library is um, that you have a type that is implemented for numbers, and if you want to be very generic over multiplication, you need to have two constants, uh, the identity element and the whatever the other one is called. The one is the First one is one and the other one is zero, but you don't know which type it has because you are writing a thing that is generic over types. So in the implementation for floating point numbers, you can say, okay, for F64, this is a constant zero floating point 64 and in floating point with 32 bits precision, you write, this is a zero with 32 bits precision. Okay, that's all. Fine. Um, there are other interesting things you need to know about traits to really get started. For example, say you write a trait and you have a function that's called clone. You might not know this, but the standard library also has a trait with a function called clone. What do you do? If you use the regular syntax of my name dot clone, you have no idea which message you're actually calling. So there is a syntax to specify which trait you actually want to call. And it's angular brackets, my data, my data type as the trait I want to treat it as, colon colon, method name. You can also write in this case, true is colon colon make true because you know that I'm only supplying one parameter, a fact, which determines that actually my implementation for fact is going to be called. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> In case that there would be actually multiple um, traits with the same methods implemented on one data type, would there be like a default method that would be called, or would it just be a compile time error if you call it with the regular syntax? So you are always required to use the special syntax in that case, or what would happen? Very good question. I actually don't know the answer to it. We can try to find out later. I think you get a compiler error if it's very unambiguous. But if you use glob imports, there may be some other rules happening. We can try it later. Like, this is a very interesting question, actually. All right. One area we haven't covered yet is what traits are also used for that you may not know. Because if you write one plus two, actually, it expands to an implementation of the add trait that is in the standard operators module. The add trait is very simple. It actually only gives you an add method, but this also means that you can write your own implementation of add if you wanted to. Like if you have a hash set and adding two hash sets together makes sense to you. Or if you wanted to be totally insane and write an implementation for divide, for pass, for example. So you can write A slash B and get it concatenated. 
please, please don't do this, but this is just my opinion. Another interesting edge case is um, a trade that has basically no content whatsoever and is still useful. These are called marker trades and you can use them to, as the name suggests, mark stuff. For example, if you wanted to say um, you only care about a specific set of types that all happen to implement display, but also needed to be fancy for some reason, you can write a fancy trait that has no methods, no types, no constants, and just implement them for your types, and then you can write a constraint that is T, where this uh, T implements display and fancy. This may sound weird at first, but it's actually how uh, Rust implements the notion of sendable and sinkable types. If you wanted to use a specific data type in multiple threads, the compiler might give you a message like, now you can't do this because this type doesn't implement send or this type doesn't implement sync. These traits do nothing, but require you to say this type is actually sendable across threads because the compiler can't prove that this type actually is sendable over threads, you give it a marker. All right, that's all I have. And thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, are traits like, for example, drop uh, primitives in the language, or are they implemented within the standard library? Do you know that? Oh, this is also a very good question. I don't have a precise answer to. Um, I'm fairly certain that they are implemented in the core library and marked as language items. So you can go either way and say, okay, this is actually a, like language specific but also it's in the core library and I could replace it. I'm not sure for drop, but for many other things, they are flagged as language items. Uh, yeah. If I have a generic implementation of a trade and I want to specialize this for one type, um, how would I do that? So can I just give a special implementation? Oh, you're only asking questions I don't have a precise answer to. I know there is a feature called specialization that is not yet stabilized, but I think there is some part that is already possible. So maybe, or maybe only with a with feature flag? But very good question, because I haven't covered this. You can implement generic implementations of traits. You can say implement this random trait I just wrote for every type T that implements display, for example. Good point. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> you had this example um, of the trait where you had a function that returned a self. Yes. Um, this looks kind of like a generic. So where's the difference between this and a trait generic? Let me try to find it Yeah. real quick. It was pretty much at the beginning, I think. I think so too, but I forgot about it. Ah, here it is. Okay, it's not a generic per se, but it is some kind of placeholder for the t 
type you're actually implementing your trade for. In this case, you know it's I32. In a more generic case, you don't know what the type actually is. And in our trade definition, you yeah, also don't know. That's one that I meant actually. Yeah. You don't know what type your implement, uh, what type your implementation is currently trying to deal with, but you don't want to, you need to need a way to actually say, I want to return the same thing I got, basically. And uppercase self is the type you're implementing for. But that's what I imagine what a generic is, isn't it? I am, I'm from C++ and uh, this mm -hmm. looks like a template function. You could say it like is a, it's an implicit generic, you could yeah. say. Okay. Yeah. You, a generic, a, a type parameter is something like this T, but our self, this, this self is not explicitly named. It's always the type we are implementing for. If that plus you don't have an equivalent of this. You just you basically just use the function and hope that the code compiles. That is what you do there. The equivalent would have been concepts that yeah. they had landed in the language. Someone added that in C++ this might be covered by concepts, mm -hmm. but not by templates themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question was where would be the difference between this and, but I think I kind of understood. I, I usually Thanks. think of self in C++ for like this. This is always a pointer to the object itself, right? And self with the big, uh, the capital S would be the type of this. No, no that I understand, but just, yes. I, I think for me, I answered it. Thank you. Okay. Since you can parameterize traits, what's the point of associated types? Mm. What if you want to parameterize a trait, but only ever implement it for one specific return type? Like if iterator was generic over its return types, you could write multiple implementations of iterator for a vector, for example. But using associated types, which are not parameterized, themselves in the implementation and signature, you can only ever provide one implementation of iterator for a vector. It's an additional constraint, basically. If that makes sense. I think I need to think about that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I have another question. Um, there's one concept, I, or one thing I've kind of been struggling with with traits. Um, um, like they're kind of only ever uh, usable if you're like in a generic context and for example like a little bit coming back to the question of the difference between interfaces uh, in a language like Java you may have uh, an interface and the type that implements that and maybe at some point you don't really care about actual data type anymore but only about uh, the stuff that's implemented in the iterator. And for example, you may want to have something like um, a vector or a list of only objects of that um, trait, iterate, uh, interface, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, you may want to have, be able to put, put different types, types in there. Like for example, as if you would want to have a vector of displayable objects. But you can't really do that in Rust because they have... I get that that they have may have different sizes and therefore you can't really put them in a vector. But is there a possibility of do to do something like that to create a vector of displayable objects? There is um, not without being very explicit about what you're doing though, because what you're doing is taking a type and throwing away everything you know about it except for that it implements display. And then you put it in a box and say, oh, now I have a pointer to something that I know implements display. And 
Then you can do this with basically every type you know influences play and put all of these boxes into a vector. So then you have literally the type vec of box of display. I've been searching for that and I kind of thought that the solution is going to be something with boxes, but what's the syntax for that? Or is there a specific name for it? It's not really like, is this called some, somewhat? Does, does it have a name? No, no, sadly not. Um, oh, look, I even tested my examples. Uh, uh, I'm going to type blindly real quick. I actually try to. So the syntax is this, but now you need to actually say what the hell these X and Y and Z are. And indeed, they are box new of, for example, uh, some number. And the type of this X is box I32. And actually, I'm not going to bother with the other ones. The type of this guy is back of box of I32. So let me see if this even compiles. Yes, it does, but I'm not using X, Y, X, S. Okay, fair enough. Now we're going to do a very complex thing and say, this is actually display. And now, just to prove this actually works, we're going to do this and see if it still compiles. Fair enough. Oh, that too, thanks. Yes. Just because I'm bothered by the warning. This is how you do yeah. very generic boxing of stuff. That's actually helped me quite a lot, thanks. Sure. Uh, there are more variants of this. You can also write a vector of displayable pointers, for example, if you don't want to actually box them, but just want to uh, have a reference stored in a vector to something you know is displayable. The implementation details for this is basically the same you do in most other languages. There is a V table. This is a virtual, virtual uh, function pointer table. So this box is actually pointer to your data and a pointer to a table that contains all the methods display is implemented, is, imp is containing, basically. Um, I'm interested to know what is happening behind the scenes. So what kind of code, machine code is generated for these statements? For these specific ones? Uh, yes, for, 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 for uh, it, in, in Java, there's something like dynamic binding or whatever. So what is have happening in Rust? Does Very he find question. out which methods are there and then he searches them somewhere or does he straight go into um, a routine? Very good question. So if you do this, or actually, if you do any of this and use it like this, you get static dispatch. So at compile time, there is a call function to a, well, a call uh, statement to a well-known function that is specific to the type you're using. For example, this is one implementation of the make true, fun make true function. This is another one. And both of them are somewhere in your machine code. And depending on what you are calling make true on, the correct one gets selected. This is also true for very generic code. So for example, if you have 
So it's implemented for every T where T is clonable, for example, and T in your case is a string. A concrete implementation for clone will be generated for strings. This is called monomorphization. So instead of having one implementation that covers all cases, a very specific implementation will be generated for the specific case of types you provide. If, on the other hand, you're doing this, you're basically enforcing the compiler to use dynamic dispatch. I'm not sure how Java's implementation looks under the hood, but I'm pretty sure they are most of the time using dynamic dispatch, except where they can prove with escape analysis and I don't know, maybe some other techniques that only ever one type will be using this method. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.